40 people commit suicide. 10 people commit suicide due to pro, uh, money problems. And actually, a lot of middle class people cannot borrow money from the banks, and they have to go to loan shark. This is ha not only happening in Korea, but happening in America and Europe. A lot of uh, uh, middle class is getting squeezed, so they we call squeeze middle. And banks should support, uh, support these people, and banks should work as a reservoir. When there is a drought, they supply water. When there is a uh, flood, they have to hold uh, water. But banks do the opposite way. When there is a drought, they hold the water. When there is a rain, they flush out the money. That's what banks do. And I was so pissed off by that. <laughs> As a banker, I was so uh, shamed. I felt so shameful myself. And I decided to change it. So I decided to create uh, invest banks myself. And it's not possible in Korea to get a license. For the last 20 years, nobody has received any license, banking license, from the government. But only 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I could get license to set up an uh, investment bank. So year 2000, I created investment bank. And I found it on a uh, different way. By raising a private equity fund, I could take over savings bank. Finally, that was uh, five years ago. And I created uh, IWL Partners and fund $120 million fund. And I spent 70 million US dollars to buy the bank and change the name to W Bank. And let me uh, uh, give you one example what I could do with the bank. I have done many different things, but uh, when the Lehman crisis happened, Korean, all Korean banks stopped lending to everyone whose credit rating is below sixth grade. Sixth grade um, out of the 10th grade is not too bad. Those are the ones who have a good job, but somehow they don't have a really good score, but they need money. Like uh, they have kids to send to school, they have parents had operations, and these kind of things, you just m need the money right now. You cannot delay it. But banks has decided not to lend at all due to the crisis. And we decide to lend toward these people who has a will to change and who, who has a low credit, but has a good job. And what we have done is uh, we had decided to lend to them at the 50% uh, interest rate uh, charged by the loan shark, which was 25%. The loan shark was charging 49%. Now it's coming down to 30% due to the government intervention, but still quite high. And even at 25%, which is 50% lower, wasn't low enough. So what I have uh, uh, come up with is, yes, if they pay on time, let's lower the rate. No bank has done that before. But uh, if they are late, if they don't pay in time, on time, and then raise the rate. And the people, the borrower can decide by themselves to, uh, to become the captain of their soul. So I call, name this uh, loan Pinocchio loan. If you're be, being honest, and your nose will be short. <laughs> but if you're bad, lying, then your nose will get longer. But this, with this, I could lend 30,000 people in the average about $10,000. And I could lend half a billion dollars. I only spent. 70 million US dollars. But due to bank effect, <coughs> multiplying effect, I could lend this much. Also, I could lend this amount of money to companies who's been shown from the financing due to Lehman crisis, due to some kind of a uh, financial 
uh, exchange related some um, toxic uh, derivative product. But I could save 50 companies and they employed 15,000 pe uh, people. So I think I might have saved some lives by doing this way. Left, uh, left side is the bank I took over. And now the change to this uh, right hand side. What I did is this. After I purchased 100% uh, of the shares from family who doesn't know how to run a bank, been running the bank for themselves only. And I uh, put, uh, changed 100% of the board members and management. I uh, injected real professionals. And I knocked down the inside, outside walls so that light can come in. And the banks become transparent, hired three times more people, and they serve much more clients and the deposit takings, our catch rate is saved with love. And we lend to the people, invest with love. So somehow, I think this buying out the bank can be a real impact investment. But to do it, you, need to, you can do this legally in any countries by setting up a private equity fund whatsoever and re pull the money together and find a person like me who is like, uh, you can change the bank with love. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was a very inspirational um, conversation. And if, not, if you leave with nothing else here today, you'll know that if you're in Korea, you have a banker you can go to. <laughs> Professor Wang, please. Okay, uh, as uh, Kapana has uh, kindly introduced me, I wear two hats. One as the director for the Entrepreneurship Center in the university, which is tasked with trying to promote entrepreneurship among the NUS community. And the second hat is uh, I'm an angel investors in early stage startups. So I'll briefly mention how both these roles relate to the topic about uh, planting the seeds for impact investing. About a dozen years ago, right after the dot-com boom, I was asked to uh, head up the University Entrepreneurship Center to try and promote entrepreneurship on campus. So one of the first things I did was to set up an incubator to incubate early state startup companies. Um, and at that time, actually the ecosystem in Singapore was not very well developed. And we therefore actually convinced the university to actually put up some seed money that we can use to invest in these early stage startup companies. And I guess over the years, the government has since introduced a whole range of schemes of core funding. And then subsequently, the angel uh, investment community started to develop. And today, I would say that uh, it is much easier now for a normal for profit startup to uh, develop. And that part of the incubation program actually in our university has worked reasonably well. We have had a number of good exits and we have a healthy pipeline of uh, startup by our professors and students. So about two years ago, I felt that maybe it's time it's ready for us to start incubating social ventures, ventures that uh, want to make an impact, but in a sustainable and scalable way. And, to, and I think we face today, or as of two years ago, and even now, a similar kind of a, uh, ecosystem for social impact investing is really not developed. And, and this reminds me of when I first started about 10, 12 years ago with the high-tech startup situations. So I feel to, to, to fill this gap because there are no investors that are willing to invest in uh, social impact-driven startups. I use uh, some discretionary sources of money we have in the, in this, in the center to really provide some seed funding. So I did something like what uh, the uh, Ashoka Fellow Scheme do. I have two calls for proposal a year, and those that have had interesting ideas, I will give them up to $10,000 to really work on validating their ideas uh, and to see that if their idea actually have a potential to, uh, to scale and that they have a business model that is likely to be sustainable. And hopefully, once they reach that stage, we will then introduce them to uh, 
investors, and also to some government schemes that are primarily at this stage only funding for profit startups. But hopefully, these uh, social impact ventures may show sufficient uh, sustainably potential that they may qualify. So that's basically how we started. So over the last two years, we have uh, seed funded about a dozen such uh, sort of uh, social ventures. And, um, and in fact, uh, two of the ventures that are social enterprises that are pitching uh, yesterday and, and today uh, are actually uh, coming out of our incubator. And let me just give you one example of one such uh, company and how we try to add value to them. This company is called SAUGHT, S-A-U-G-H-T. Uh, it actually was started by two uh, law graduates from NUS, two young ladies who had this idea of trying to uh, really spread the message about the harm and the danger that still continue to be caused by uh, landmines and uh, unexploded bombs in many parts of the world where it's still war-torn. But unlike the traditional approach of using philanthropy to raise money to then preach this message, they used the social business ideas. So basically what they did is, what we funded them to do is this. They went to Cambodia, they worked with the NGO that is in trying to uh, take this scrap metal out of the uh, disused bombs and landmines. And they take this scrap metal, work with another NGO in Cambodia to train the villagers to make jewelry out of these scrap metals. And then they set up a uh, uh, e-commerce website to market these jewelries, uh, which are sort of, but with a clear message that this is that you are for peace, that you are trying to uh, you know, solve this social problem. And so we gave them the seed funding to actually do the necessary few work in Cambodia and so on. And we also linked them up with a uh, polytechnic in Singapore, which happened to have a diploma program for students to uh, do, do jewelry design. And so we take the students to actually initially come up with the first batch of design, and then the student with these uh, two entrepreneurs would go to Cambodia and then work with the local people to train them how to actually make the jewelry. And I believe that they actually now have set up the website and they actually have started to sell quite well their, their first batch of jewelry. And based on this validation, we then helped them to apply for a government seed funding grant uh, of $50,000. And uh, this is the situation that they are now, that they are going to expand this business uh, activities in Cambodia. At the same time, we're helping them to find other, hopefully well-known designer who may want to donate their design to support this cause. And of course, their long-term goal is not to just do it in Cambodia, but in Afghanistan and wherever there's this uh, uh, a problem. So this is an example where we have stu student entrepreneurs who are passionate about a social cause, but want to use the uh, social business ideas to really achieve a sustainable and scalable business. Our challenge, of course, is that uh, we can only help them get to a stage, first, seed validate their idea, and secondly, hopefully, maybe get another government uh, support scheme of about 50,000, which are meant for young entrepreneurs, but their business idea must be according to this government scheme. It doesn't really support social impact, but it supports potentially profitable business. And so we have actually now three such of our incubating companies who qualify under this scheme. Our challenge now really is that from there, until you can grow to a point where they are investable by impact investor, there's still a gap. If you look at the kind of deals that, say, Acumen Fund and other well-established impact investment fund invest, they invest in much later stages. And so we will still need to have this gap to be filled. And I personally hope that uh, something like the Impact Exchange, IX, might be able to help build this part of the support infrastructure. So uh, in that sense, we are building the early stage pipeline just as we did about a dozen years ago in building the high-tech early-stage startup. And hopefully in a few years' time, with the help of 
AI exchange, we might be able to finally have a complete sort of uh, value change uh, that will support uh, early stage startup all the way. So turning briefly to my head as an angel investor, uh, I have invested in the normal for profit tech startups in Silicon Valley, China, India, and Singapore. And I also personally feel that it's time that I also do a little bit of impact investing, but at an early stage. So I've been looking for such an uh, investable idea myself. And very briefly, uh, I have done two so far, one in China, where I felt that really one of the, the need in Asia is for many elderly to be able to be cared at home. A lot, of, a lot of elderly would prefer to die at home and uh, to be cared at home rather than, than to be put into a hospital or in uh, old folks' homes. So one of the business I invested in is actually to provide a home visit care where trained, qualified nurses will visit the family at home, help them do the measurement, maybe administer the medication and so on. And if there's a problem, then call the doctors to uh, then come and examine them. And I believe that that idea uh, has a significant uh, social impact. Uh, of course, in order for it to be, uh, to be able to get growing, we need to initially target the middle class uh, family who can actually afford to pay to validate the business. Uh, and I'm glad to say that uh, this business now, uh, a few of us angel investors have invested in, and we have got a follow-on angel investors who put in another a million US and we are now at the stage of actually rolling out this business beyond just uh, Beijing but also to Shanghai and other places. But the long-term goal is really to be able to move this business model to even serve lower income family and the key challenge there is to build up the sort of uh, the business logistic and also the scale economy. So that would be an example of something that I believe uh, we would like to be able to grow it to a point where impact investors will find it interesting to invest in. Uh, and just to finish up with another example would be uh, uh, another startup by two uh, uh, young women graduate from our university as well, who uh, wanted to start a company to really teach financial literacy to young children. And again, their long-term goal is to really to do this for low-income families, because that's where, in fact, a lot of the problem uh, uh, rises. But again, in order to be able to be viable, to get investment and so on, they initially target the, uh, perhaps the middle and upper middle class families uh, with a product that is essentially involved using gamification, but involvement of the parent in social media, iPad and so on. But uh, we believe that again, the longer term goal is to be able to actually reach out to even a much larger sort of uh, groups. But we are trying to apply the social business idea to make sure that it is first uh, sustainable, that it is profitable, and then hopefully then we will scale to a point where we can be invested in by impact investors that can then allow us to do this in more emerging markets as well. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Um, you've heard some three intriguing different aspects, approaches to the problem, and, uh, the, and as Professor Wong pointed out at the end, the need for organizations such as uh, Impact Exchange Asia to exist and thrive. But at this point, I'm, I'm going to open it up for questions, and uh, let's see where the questions take us. And I, I know I have a few questions that I'm going to ask the panelists later, but can someone like to start? Yes, please. Hi, I've got a question for Israel Harness Um My name's Emma. I grew up in Perth in Western Australia, um, and we have serious mosquito issues there. Um, but we also have a, a big mineral exploration industry. And, and as far as I see it, mining exploration and biotech have a similarly high risk, um, lots lots start, not so many make it, um, and, and it's a really long-term return as well. There's not a lot of dividends on the way. Something that we've noticed is that um, there are a lot of really eager investors in, in mining exploration, particularly in Western Australia, um, but 
but biotechs really struggle. And we've got a lot of, you know, there, we've won Nobel Prizes um, for, for biotech in, um, in Perth. So to, uh, someone said to me that maybe it was big, phar big pharmaceutical companies that, ma that maybe made it not a feasible area for investors. Um, but I'd be interested to know whether, whether you think there are real parallels in these two industries and whether there's something we could learn from mining. Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm in both. <laughs> but I, I must say I'm not an expert in the mining side. But certainly, I, I think biotech, um, it's always a big struggle. Um, I think we were fortunate in finding the, the, the Ministry of Science and the biotech. But, but really, when we went around the whole market, um, it was extremely difficult to try and get angel investors. Even though I, we, we sort of explained, uh, you know, we've actually won this number one science prize, I think everyone said, well, OK, come back in a year's time when you've sort of um, uh, rolled it out a bit more. We've rolled it out a bit more. And uh, up, up to date, it's, it's all been the shareholders' money. Uh, to where we are, the shareholders' money, admittedly, the, the government did, did give us the funds. But now we're on the cusp of going global is where we have been engaging uh, with uh, impact investors. Um, I, I was in San Moritz and uh, at this uh, philanthropy, uh, I, I met all the family businesses, etc. But very few want to invest directly into the uh, biotech company. I think a lot of them are quite happy to go through funds. So we're now talking with funds. Um, uh, on, on, the, on the big pharma, uh, I, I think, you know, like, uh, as I said earlier, all the larvicide up to now has been chemical. So when suddenly they see this young startup company going into bio larvicide with a biotech product, they see this as a threat. And quite often, we find this in, at the registration stage where we need to be registered there's a lot of stumbling blocks there. They ask us a thousand and one questions because there's a lot of vested interests by these big farmers and uh, people who have been selling um, chemicals since World War I. But what I'm telling them, this is a century for biolarviciding. We don't need chemicals at all. And, um, but slowly we are, um, we are uh, sort of making our way for example, today, yesterday and today, uh, Sri Lankan government uh, sent an SOS, SOS to us to come down immediately. So we sent the team down on Monday uh, because they had a dengue scourge and uh, I think there's a senior banker whose son, 19-year-old son died and someone else's son died and really it just hit the society. And then suddenly in today's, I, I, just, I just read in today's uh, mail from Sri Lanka, the, their stock of the chemicals that they had, or the BTI, some of the BTI that they had, were already expired. So suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly uh, we're there, we're prominent, and uh, in fact, it's a, you know, our agent there said, come, desperately come, come by. So hopefully um, we will overcome, because we're still not registered in Sri Lanka, because um, we just couldn't get through. So these are the sort of stumbling blocks. On the mining side, um, Really, yes, I, I think it's, it's, it's always a big struggle to go from exploration all the way into production. And uh, yes, and it can be long term um, and similarly with biotech as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow up with a question here. I, I think cognizant of the fact that we're trying to find solutions to this funding gap that um, Professor Wong uh, emphasized. And, the very intriguing story that you heard from, um, from DH about his experiments with, with banking in, in Korea. And uh, Tunku and I had a conversation yesterday when we first met that, you know, why, why do the old community banks no longer exist? We have all these big banks that have their problems and we, we, we know what the issues there are with funding startups. They either go through their own proprietary funds or they stay away from the business. But uh, some, I, I can ask this question because I'm somewhat new to the, the region. Is there a potential to, for a revival of the kind that um, DH talked about uh, in, in other parts of Asia? And are, are we 
Are those options that need to be looked at by the impact investment community? And uh, you know, do we, can we do this without government intervention like you did, just taking institutions private and making them responsible for the communities that they live in? Yeah, I think uh, I chose a uh, track that uh, which I don't need uh, too much intervention or approval from the government. And also, when you have some kind of uh, system problems, I think it's much rather easier just fix it and reuse it instead of uh, building a whole new system. And we have uh, quite a decent system. The current capitalism and the market, and banks, money, and investors, you know, those are quite, has been quite uh, efficient. Yes, it has, co has produced a serious amount of side effects, which is hurting whole, you know, ecosystem of the world. But if you change, I think, the bank, if you can if you can be able to change the banks, then I think the ecosystem will be restored. So I think changing bank can be a quite a good option. You can start a small scale, but, but also, I mean, uh, social entrepreneur is really great, and you want to see a scalability. So, and my approach is somehow you are, your approach is like uh, coming from the bottom, and I'm coming down from the top. Do it at once, <laughs> once and for well to change it whole system, and it did see is very workable, because investors who want to do something good really afraid of taking the risk because not because they're not willing to take risk, but because they cannot understand the. Uh, nature of the risk is taking. How can find uh, you know this bioproduct is really good for the human or is bad for the nature? He he never know, so he can't make a decision. That's why in a bio industry cannot attract uh, enough investors. So somehow, if you use the existing fund system. And if you change the banks, then some of the specialist banks will be able to provide enough financing to all the social entrepreneurs. So I think you know, changing banks is a very crucial, and this is time to do it. Big banks, we got to change the big banks first. <laughs> But uh, we need to uh, raise enough money. But fortunately, <laughs> banks are so cheap. <laughs> now, you have to understand that. This is time to do it. Otherwise, normally, it's going to be too expensive. But if you buy the banks, like Citibank, the Deutsche Bank, it's very cheap now. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> A very revolutionary concept, but I like it. Um, Professor Wang, just, uh, just to follow up with you before I throw it open to the audience again, given your background, is that possible? Can you buy a bank and change it? Well, I, I have no expertise in this, so, but all I can say is that in the commercial banks, uh, not only do they uh, have difficulty lending to social ventures, they can't even lend to normal for-profit startups because their number one criteria is I have to have collaterals that I can seize in case the, uh, they can't pay. So most tech startups don't have physical collaterals. They have ideas, they have patterns, they have, uh, you know. And so in social ventures, it's even harder. So unless the social venture can give them something that they can seize, they will never lend to them. And in fact, my own experience, even for my normal for-profit startups, the usual rule is that uh, banks will only lend to you when you don't need them. <laughs> so it's true, when, when we were at the early stage struggling, right? They will say, you, you know, when you make certain higher revenue with a profit, we'll lend to you. But when we make it, we don't need them, yeah? So I think 
I believe that uh, one of the reasons it's difficult for the banks to change is because of under globalizations. Banks begin to have to compete against one another on the, to achieve the same returns. So the kind of community banks that you talk about have to be either in an environment where they, their investors or their shareholders uh, maybe have a different set of objectives. But otherwise, then it may be difficult for them for the, to, to, to justify you know, uh, the kind of investment profile that they, that they invest in. The other second thing is that you need specialties. So like, for example, a Silicon Valley bank uh, had over the year developed specialties and they could therefore take certain kind of risky investments because they have that special knowledge. So unless you have a bank that also cultivate that kind of, of uh, special uh, knowledge, in, in, in the case of a community bank, it will be a bank that has really deep domain knowledge and understanding of the local community, like the way Grameen Bank operate because they really are into the community. So unless you really have banks that are willing to invest in that, it will be difficult and probably the change will have to be in the, you need a different set of investor investor like him the normal for profit investor will not allow a bank to operate in the way that he he, he described yeah. it's still a very intriguing thought but uh, i'll i'll take another question from the audience here yes Talking about funding gaps, and I'd like to know your experience as an investor and as someone uh, raising capital for social enterprise. Where is the biggest gap? Is it at the seed funding stage when you need that first ten or fifty thousand dollars? Is it when you need the next million? Is it when you're looking to scale up and you need two to ten million dollars in equity, or is it when you need a bank loan? Where's the biggest gap? Where is it hardest? Or is it hard at all stages? I suppose um, my experience, because it's, it's not just the, uh, with regard to Entergenics, it's, it's uh, with, with other companies that, uh, that I've been involved with. Um, I suppose the, depending what kind of personality you are, you know, but I, I think seed funding is easier than the uh, scaling up. Uh, I think, I think de depending on what, what your project is, you know, you go to, and how old you are, you can go to your old university friends and raise uh, a few thousand each each of you and, and set up a company. So I, I think, you know, and, and, and you've got to get the right technology, you've got to be able to have the right spiel to explain to them, etc. You've, you've got to be a little bit of a marketing man and you'll get your seed fund. No problem, okay? So you all have hope, all right? Uh, but it's really the next stage, going to the banks. And I know the Malaysian experience is that from 19, uh, the 1986 uh, economic downturn, the Minister of Finance in Malaysia decided that, okay, we must go through a consolidation of all the banks. There will only be 10 banks in Malaysia. And suddenly, what disappeared was all these mum and pops banks and uh, the neighborhood banks, which were the banks who were actually, like you, with love, the most friendly. And these big banks are so anonymous. So, so really, the scaling up and going to a big bank is really very, very difficult. Even for me, I go to them, the first thing they say is, what collateral do you have? Can you keep, uh, I lend you two million, but you put two million fixed deposit. I mean, that's silly, you know? <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that we, we face. I would say for uh, social ventures in the Singapore environment, uh, it's very difficult to raise uh, funding, say, from uh, 250,000 to maybe a couple of millions. I think it's, you can get uh, seed investment up to you know, a couple of hundred thousand. But beyond that, they really they this, this get, I mean, to reach to the level of the acumen funds, of the, you know, uh, you need to have uh, really, they are talking about investing in the range of tens of millions. So, bridging that gap is, is where I see, you know, will be your, will be your job in the IIX, yeah. Yes, please, in the back. Good morning. My name is Vai. I'm from the Philippines. So, our business model right now is we're about to scale up. Um, we have a community-based roasting machine, which is marketed for the base of the pyramid or for the coffee farmers in the Philippines. 
and I have approached several funders and they have informed me that um, our project is good for either in-house financing or I either partner with an MFI. So from your point of view, um, what can you give me, what advice can you give me if I could go in-house financing or which is better, in-house financing or I partner with an MFI so that I would be able to um, provide these roasting machines to the coffee farmers and um, filter it down to the base of the pyramid. Thank you. Uh, DH, do you want to take that question? Uh, you know, there, there is a new uh, way of uh, funding method is uh, coming up almost everywhere in the world, which is called crowdfunding. And I, I think this is a very sensible way because um, when you're in a very early stage, risk is very high. And actually, you are, what you're looking for is not a lot of money. So if you can get uh, like uh, 10,000 backers for your ideas, which is not too difficult if you use internet, like uh, SNS, Facebook, whatever method. And then people can donate, like uh, not donate, invest like uh, $100. Then you have a million dollars like that, 10,000. So uh, I think uh, crowdfunding is the way to go. And, but some countries, actually, they make illegal, raising money from the crowd from more than 50 people. It becomes very illegal. But many countries changing their stance to allow crowdfunding legal. So, I think each country, I think somebody, some social entrepreneur should start uh, serving, you know, providing the crowdfunding services and connected each other with other countries. And then, you run, and then your risk, risk will be diversified and showed by people. It's like insurance. But this is going to solve your problems, people's problems. So in the end, crazy ideas always makes a lot of money, <laughs> but very crazy, too crazy to get funding from very cold-headed bankers. So it's not possible. Forget about it. <laughs> Don't try. So it's going to be a waste of time unless you ch buy the bank yourself and change it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think crowdfunding can be a good solution. Daniel, do we have time for one more question? Yes. Any, any other questions? Yes, please. Sorry, this is kind of a lead up to the question which Dennis was asked. It appears that when we're looking at um, impact investments, you have basically spoken mainly of social enterprises that are more the urban and developed country point of view, where they could potentially be a high return on investment in addition to social impact. And then on the other hand, people talk about based pyramid, but at the same time, in that market, there's the $4, the $2 day, the $3. Once you go down the pyramid, it, the business model has changed. It becomes maybe single returns after 15 years. So do you see the need for differentiation in terms of the different, like you mentioned crowdfunding, and perhaps crowdfunding would be perfect for areas where the return might be a little less. But do you see an opportunity here to, to actually show a differentiation so that people kind of, like yourself, trying to raise money, kind of knows which type of investor they should be connecting with as opposed to a general cloud of social impact or impact investment. Who'd like to take that? Well, I, I, I think if you are looking at some of the social ventures uh, that whose goal is to actually develop and validate uh, a, a, a particular way to solve a problem, and then you try to then replicate it by encouraging and train up local entrepreneurs to do it. So like, for example, Grameen Shakti is a, that sort of model, right? In that case, I think the way to fund will be to actually work with MFI, because it is a micro-funding institution, will then fund the local entrepreneur who will take your validated idea, and then they will grow them. So rather than you yourself trying to grow them, I think that could be one way to go. The other is that if you develop a product that is really uh, aiming at the bottom pyramid, but it's low cost enough, 
but you don't have the ability to build the uh, distribution channel and so on, it may be possible that you actually partner with a multinational corporations who will then have the uh, distribution channel to actually distribute your product for you. And so you just concentrate on actually developing that, that product and service itself. And I've seen both of these being done successfully so that you actually do not grow the business yourself. You actually validated it and then you work with partners to, to replicate it. So if your goal is to create job and empowering local entrepreneurs, then your business model should be to work with uh, either a network of MFI or with a private equity fund that actually have invested in MFI and have them to actually fund that part of the growth. So that would be at least these two models I've seen as alternative to you raising funding for yourself to grow them. Maybe yes, I just have a, a quick comment on that. I, I think it's important to dif differentiate between whether you're the product that you have or the machine that you have is it really in the blue ocean or the red ocean? Again, this is going back to the technology. If you have some really great technology, you're probably in the blue ocean. But if you've got a technology which 20 other people have and you're just one of many, you're in the red ocean. So I, I think you know, if you really want to succeed, I think try to be in the blue ocean. Thank you. I'm afraid I think we have to cut it off there, and Daniel has a few closing comments. I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking our moderator and panelists for an extraordinary discussion. <laughs> the thought leadership that our panelists have displayed in applying methods uh, of impact investing in sectors not traditionally associated with that. Uh, we've heard about biotechnology, retail banking, uh, and high tech. Uh, this is the sort of innovative thinking that we need to catalyze the potential of impact investing to drive bottom of the pyramid solutions to global challenges of poverty and healthcare. So thank you very much, and it's unfortunate that we have to transition to lunch now, um, but uh, as a small token of our appreciation, we have uh, gifts for our moderator and panelists. Lunch will be served downstairs. Thank you. <laughs>